In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about 70 individuals who are unnamed. Now, of course, if they are 70, it's a group of people. They are going to be unnamed because they are too many to name and there's no maybe benefits for us in knowing who they are in terms of their names. But we're still reciting their story today. In Surah Al-A'raf, verse 155, Musa alayhi had to choose 70 men, 70 rajulan li miqatina, to meet so that they could do what? So they can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Because basically, Bani Israel had worshipped the golden calf after Musa alayhi left. So now they have to ask Allah for forgiveness. He chooses 70 of his best men. And here's what happens. On the way there, a group of them became very bold and they crossed the line. And they said, Arina Allah They said, we want to see, O Musa, we want to see Allah with our own eyes. So they crossed the line. They were struck and they were killed. And Musa alayhi salam begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, forgive us. Ya Allah, please forgive them. Ya Allah, you are the all merciful. You're the one who forgives. Anta waliyuna, you are uh, our ally. You are our supporter. You are our protector. We have no one but you, Ya Allah. Please forgive them for that. Are you going to destroy us because of what the foolish amongst us have done? Ya Allah, please forgive us. So Musa alayhi salam begs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his rahmah, for his mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrects those 70 men, unnamed individuals, a group of people, all struck and they were killed, they were punished for what they did, for transgressing, for their arrogance, but then they were resurrected and they begged Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Now, what's interesting here is that today there are a lot of people who hold on to their arrogance, no matter what happens, no matter how many opportunities they get, and they don't repent. They don't change their ways. Their hearts remain hardened. And they hold on to their arrogance as a way of life. In fact, there are people today who say they won't believe in God unless they see God with their own eyes. La ilaha illallah. Who are you to ask for that? Who are you to request that? Who do you think you are in terms of your status to demand that the only way you will believe in God is if you can see God with your own eyes? Have some humility. Isn't it logically possible isn't it conceivable in your mind that there are evidences, proofs that, are, that God exists, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is real without you having to see Allah with your own eyes? Of course it's possible. And so oftentimes we find in these conversations and I've had so many conversations with people like this, some who left atheism and became Muslims, some who left atheism and became believers in God, some who remained as atheists, staunch, dogmatic atheists. But it started off with one question. And this is a question that many ex-atheists have asked to their former fellow atheists. What is it? What would convince you to believe in God? What would convince you? What is enough evidence for you? For you to say this is sufficient evidence for the one who's really looking to believe in God. I asked this question once to someone who said, prove to me that God exists. And this is, this is the starting point for so many of my conversations with people who are still atheists and people who left atheism. He said, prove to me that God exists. And I asked, what would convince you? What is proof? What would suffice? And he thought about it in one story. For example, he thought about it. He said, if I could see God with my own eyes, or he healed someone right in front of me, right now, that would be evidence of his existence. I said, okay, I see what you're saying. Isn't it possible that there are other evidences as well? aside from the one you mentioned, that God has to appear before you and heal someone right now before you, isn't it possible, logically in your mind, that there could be other evidences out there? Like he could heal someone else, but you didn't see it? He's like, yeah, that's possible. I said, okay, I want to ask you a question. How many possibilities are there? He said, countless, of course. He's actually made a lot of progress without realizing it up to this point. Countless possibilities, evidences for the reality of God, aside from the one that you mentioned. Okay, great. You've just proven to this person, and actually they've proven to themselves, they've admitted that the request that they had by limiting, limiting the evidence that they wanted to believe in God was limited in an, un, uh, an irrational, and unreasonable way. That it's much greater than that. Many more possibilities. Great. I said, what other possible evidences are there? And he listed random examples. I said, okay, I have a random thought. Isn't it possible that one of these evidences is the speech of God? That God could have speech Kalamullah, that God speaks and that He revealed to us His speech and there are signs within it to answer the questions we've all been asking. 
humans have been asking, why do we exist? What is the purpose of life? Where are we headed? Who is God? Tell us about the names and attributes. What's after death? It's like, I guess it's possible, yes. It's possible that God has speech and that that is an evidence, but it has to have something within it that proves it's from God. I said, wonderful, great. Like what? He says, for example, maybe it has knowledge that no human being has access to, like knowledge of the future. Maybe it describes things in a way that no human being could possibly describe. Of course, he's like, it can't have any mistakes, any errors, because if we find an error, then we falsify it. It cannot be the speech of God. It's probably the speech of man. He said, okay, what else? He starts listing things, and of course, what is he listing here? He's listing here many different things that he's not aware of, that we already know about in terms of I'jaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. I said, can I introduce you to I'jaz al-Qur'an, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an? He's like, I already know about Islam, I already know about the Qur'an, I, I, I saw like everything I see. I said, I don't think you did, because you just described what you're looking for, and it sounds like you're looking for the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, after a number of conversations, a number of uh, discussions, in-depth discussions about I'jaz al-Qur'an, he ended up becoming Muslim. The conversation started with what? He said, I want to see God with my eyes, and then I will believe. Or if God heals someone in front of me, then I'll believe. But if you're really looking for the truth, you're really looking for an evidence that could change your perspective, then you have to be willing to consider that there are other evidences out there. Arrogance prevents people from doing that. If there's any humility left, any amount of the fitrah, the natural disposition that's still pure, then you wouldn't request something arrogant like that. You look at the evidences as they are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us humility, guide us and guide others through us, and make us from amongst those who are constantly asking Allah for forgiveness and looking for His signs all around us and accepting the signs around us and within us. Allahumma amin.